So I'd like to take you through one more exercise with kind of nomenclatural effects of new information. Uh, again, a phylogeny. Um, and just, this is perhaps just to, to give you kind of one more view of the things that Rafe was talking about. I think his examples illustrated almost all the points were spot on. So maybe this is unnecessary, but just to give you a, a little bit of, of repetition, because anytime you bring a new perspective on the evolution of a group, you may have some of these effects to deal with. So this is a paper by our own dear Mark Robbins. Um, it's a multi-gene estimate of the phylogeny of night jars and nighthawks. And so we're talking about these organisms. Um, they're nocturnal or crepuscular, uh, very wide mouth, uh, almost invariably this gray, white, and black plumage. Uh, I'm sure that each of you has seen them whether or not you recognize them as caprimulgids. So essentially, very early on in this study, Mark and his colleagues realized that they had some very interesting things going on. And this is a lot like Rafe's uh, result with Platymantis, where you have this big, they're called garbage can genera. You know, they're just a, a genus or a family or what have you where lots of taxa get dumped, and maybe even everybody kind of knows that they're not really monophyletic, but they get maintained just for lack of attention. Another very good example of a garbage can genus is the robins or the thrushes in the genus Turtus, globally distributed, and everybody knows it's not monophyletic but nobody's really done that global analysis yet. So for Caprimulgus, right away their results were showing that, sorry, for Caprimulgids, right away the results were showing that Caprimulgus was not monophyletic. And so just to orient you to this, this is, each one of these trees is an outgroup, which are related families. This pair of lineages Eurystopodus. One species of um, Caprimulgus. And then three clades of New World Caprimulgids and one monophyletic clade of Old World Caprimulgids. And so that's a huge compaction. The real tree is this. And we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. But they wanted to be sure that there was good, firm support for the arrangements that, um, that they were going to be proposing. And this might be the one little an annex that I would add to Rafe's presentation. It's not just what the tree tells you, but it's also how much you believe the tree. And so remember Rafe gave you five or six options and one of them made for 200 changes and one of them made for 50 changes, right? Well, another, certainly choosing 50 over 200 changes is a, is a very good reasoning for why to choose that option. But another option or another factor in your choice should be if there are parts of your tree that you're not very sure of, then you may not want to make a lot of big nomenclatural changes based on those things that either you're not sure of or maybe even you're pretty, pretty sure that they will change. So um, that's just one other consideration and I'm going to show you examples of that. So here's the real tree that they produced and I'll orient you to this a bit. Uh, Steatornis is called an oil bird uh, and then we have Batrachostomus podargus and Egatheles. Those are three other major lineages in this order. Okay, and then, um, and here are Potus, which are another family, Nictibiidae. So our real in-group begins right here, okay? And so we have good, strong evidence. These, these usually indicate uh, character state changes. Good, strong evidence that the Caprimulgidae is monophyletic. 
That's the first question. And so in that sense, the old time taxonomists were quite correct. The Caprimulgidae is a natural group. It is monophyletic. That's right here. Here and all of its descendants. Now, all I've done is to take the discussion of this paper and break it into pieces and show you why they're making the decisions they're making. So it'll be about six pairs of slides like this. Okay, major taxonomic revision is warranted, which is to say the phylogeny is well resolved in substantial agreement with all previous molecular work on the phylogeny, give citations, good tax on sampling. So what they're saying is earlier studies were too preliminary to be able to make these taxonomic rearrangements. But this study indeed was pretty, pretty well based as of you know, four or five years ago. So we seek, in proposing a new classification, we seek first to have all named taxa represent monophyletic groups, right? Second, we seek, we seek stability of the named taxa. We retain currently recognized taxa and then this is this, this kind of additional consideration of stability. When more than one scheme is available, we opt for the one that believe, we believe is more likely to remain viable in the face of new data. Okay? So it's all about monophyly and stability. So here's our tree, and we're going to walk through it. It's kind of bottom to top, or uh, I guess it's bottom and then top down. So while la large genetic distances separate Eurostopodus from all other Caprimulgids, erecting the family Eurostopodidae, which was suggested by Sibley and Alquist in 1990, for those who were sitting with me at breakfast, this is the, the DNA-DNA hybridization phonetic analysis dressed up as phylogenetic analysis. It was a very dark era in ornithology. Or dividing the Caprimulgidae into two subfamilies, the Eurostopodinae and Caprimulgidae, now seems inadvisable. Okay, it says the traditional family is clearly monophyletic. We just saw that. That's this. And subdividing at this time would be problematic because of the discovery of two divergent lineages in Eurostopodus. And so what they're saying is here we have a clade of three Eurostopodus, but then Eurostopodus macrotus is not grouping with the rest of its genus. Okay? So the old idea was how about if we make these four taxa and others that aren't included, one family or subfamily, and all the rest another. But here we have evidence of non monophyly of the Eurostopodini or Eurostopodidae. So then, among the basal taxa, Eurostopodus macrotus is very differentiated from the other Eurostopodus. We believe it merits being placed in a separate genus, for which, here we go to our terminology, the name Lincornus is available, which is to say somebody at some point put Eurostopodus macrotus in that genus Lincornus. So the name is available, and they're, they're making this rearrangement because Eurostopodus macrotus doesn't form a monophyletic group with the other species in that genus. Now, they didn't have any tissue of Eurostopodus teminki. It is likely sister to Macrotus since the two species share various similarities such as the presence of ear tufts. So, tentatively, they're going to put teminki and Macrotus in Lincornus. So, what they're saying is Macrotus is not part of this monophyletic group and the type species of Eurostopodus is clearly down here. So they're going to put the generic name Lincornus here. And they're saying tentatively until somebody gets some tissue of Teminki, we're guessing that Teminki will also go in Lincornus. Okay, now the other point they're making in that paragraph is about this lineage that I've marked in blue, Capromulgus enteratus. Notice that 
all of this has caprimulgus here and there, all the way throughout all of these clades. And then Enaratus falls basal to that big clade. The type species, so, so this is Caprimulgus enteratus is more divergent from the core Caprimulgids than any of the four major clades, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, are from each other. So we'll see at the end, the type species in the genus Caprimulgus is not enteratus, and there was no generic name available for enteratus. So we'll see at the end, they're going to describe a new genus. Okay, so that's those two branches. Now, within the core Caprimulgids, so within this group, they see four strongly supported major clades, and that provides a natural partitioning scheme, but numerous taxa need to be reassigned to reflect the non monophyly of the current genus Caprimulgus. Okay, again, look, Caprimulgus here here, here, um, here, here, there, there, and, and then that one that falls outside. Here are the four clades that they are finding, and each one of the four includes something from our garbage bag genus Caprimulgus. Okay? Additionally, a number of small or monotypic genera should be subsumed. This is exactly what was happening with Rafe's frogs. So let's look at one of these in, uh, in detail. The Old World clade includes Caprimulgus, and that name goes all the way back to, it, it includes Caprimulgus europaeus, and that genus goes all the way back to Linnaeus in 1758 which Dr. Fokum told us about this morning. So that means that the old world clade holds on to the name Caprimulgus. So we're looking at this clade up here, and Europaeus is right there at the top. So that holds on to that generic name, and that means that this whole clade can stay as Caprimulgus. Okay, but look at this, Macrodipteryx, is right here nestled well within Caprimulgus. If you want to keep Caprimulgus as a genus, you could, in theory, apply it just to these five species and retain Macrodipteryx as a genus. But then every one of these lineages would also have to be its own separate genus. That's a lot of nomenclatural instability. So, Let's read about Macrodipteryx. While the primaries of breeding Macrodipteryx are spectacularly modified, they may have re evolved rapidly under intense sexual selection. To maintain Macrodipteryx as a separate genus would require erection of at least six other genera just within the old world clade, just within that top clade. What a mess. And little guarantee of monophyly for most of them. That's because there wasn't such good support nearer the tips of that clade. So what they're going to propose is to keep all of this as Caprimulgus, but these two species have to change their generic names. Okay, so now we're on to New World 2. And if you notice, that is Cordelis, okay, C-H-O-R-D-E-I-L-E-S. These are called Nighthawks. And then there's this one other genus in there, Potager nacunda. So you should be asking two questions. One is, are these two genera monophyletic? Potager is because there's only one species there. But look at Cordelis. Okay, here's the root of Cordelis and it includes all of the descendants, but Potager is a descendant of that root. Oops, what is Cordelis? Is it monophyletic, is it polyphyletic, or is it paraphyletic? 
Poiphyletic means two separate ancestors. Paraphyletic means one ancestor, but not all of the descendants. Say it. Paraphyletic. Okay, why? Because it includes this ancestor and all of its descendants except Pottinger. So Cordelis is paraphyletic. Let's look at that. Um, all New World two species should be assigned to Cordelis, which has priority, it's an older name, over the monotypic Pottinger. Um, they're pretty sure that this species, which was not sampled in this study, also belongs in Cordelis. Um, but they're saying, oh, and this, this recently described Cordelis vigardi should actually be a nictoprogne, which is in another clade. So we're pretty sure that that'll be an NW3. We're not talking about vigardi going into Cordelis or staying in Cordelis. Okay? So that does it for New World 2. Now, look at New World 3. That's this clade. I'm going to read you the genera. Hydropsilus, Capromolgus, Europsilus, Capromolgus, Eleothreptus, Capromolgus, Nyctodromus, Capromolgus, Nyctoprogne, that's the one where Vigardi goes, and Luricalis. So this huge mess of fairly distinct Capromolgid species. So what do we do? I'm not going to read all of this. Um, currently subdivided into seven genera, and the oldest of those, the oldest available generic name, turns out to be Hydropsilus. Okay? An unsampled eighth genus will probably go here as well, and so we're going to put it in Hydropsilus tentatively for the moment. It'll be nice to get some tissue of it and make sure of that. They say, now, this course may seem drastic, but the polytomy at the base of NW3, a polytomy is when you don't have good resolution. And so you can see one, two, three lineages all joined by this node. That's a polytomy, okay? But they're basically saying, if we were to split this into genera, we really wouldn't know how to split it. So a more conservative approach would be to put all of this into Hydropsilus. And of course, the traditionalists are going to get upset. Oh my god, you changed my generic name. But this discussion of this paper is actually striving towards the same goal that Rafe pointed out to you, which is changing the fewest number of names. And so they're really, they're really trying. Um, they mentioned Capromolgus candicans as sister to Eleothreptus, so it's got to be in here. So they're just kind of reviewing all of these New World Capromolgid genera and making sure they belong in Hydropsilus, which used to apply to just a small number of species, and now it's going to apply to one-third of all of the species of Capromolgids in the New World. So that's New World 3. Now let's look at New World 1. So that's this node and everything below it. And let's see what we're seeing. We've got a bunch of Capromolgus, including the Capromolgus that are, that have invaded north into North America and you know, are within a few kilometers of my house. We've got Phalaenoptilus, Nyctophrynus, and Siphonorus. Now this is a different case. Notice that Siphonorus is monophyletic. Okay, it's one species. Notice that Nyctophrynus is monophyletic. And then here's another, uh, another uh, single species genus, so it's monophyletic. And all of the Capromolgus are monophyletic. So if we believe in stability, what do we do? Anybody going to help me? You guys are being really quiet. Okay, so what, the, what do they say? Well, Siphonorus is clearly basal and it's going to continue to be recognized. No reason to change the name. Nyctophrynus 
is the sister to the rest of the taxa within inside of Siphonorus. It can remain as it was previously. All other taxa should be put in antrostomus. Now this is an interesting judgment call. So what they said is leave this as Siphonorus, leave this as Nyctophrinus, and then they're saying everything from my finger on should be put into uh, antrostomus. But notice we have Phalaenoptilus that is recognized as a genus, so why not retain it? Well, they've got to deal with that. It may be argued that Phalaenoptilus deserves generic status because of its remarkable physiology. It's the only bird known to hibernate. And such treatment may be feasible in the future. At this time, following that course would require two more genera to ensure monophyly on the combined tree. Now why is that? I don't see that. Unless they're, maybe they're referring to a different tree. Because that doesn't make sense to me. So every one of you, when we get to chimpanzee camp, day after tomorrow, you walk up to Mark and you say, what were you thinking when you subsumed Phalaenoptilus within Antrostomus? Just go up to him and you know, just wave your hands like that, okay? Anyhow, that's a good question because here on this tree, I would be, um, I would retain it. Now I'm seeing one reason why they may be wanting to subsume it. Look at this. Anybody know what these numbers are? The degree of support, statistical support for that node on the tree. And all of the nodes we've been interpreting have been near 100, so it's high statistical support. But this one, notice that it's 56%. So we really don't know that Phalaenoptilus and this and this are not one uh, single lineage. So that's probably what they were referring to. The, the, the wording is not at all clear. And then they deal with a bunch of species that are not included in this study because there were no tissue available. So now we've dealt with this, and essentially we have Siphonorus, Nyctophrinus, and then this broader genus Antr Antrostomus. Now remember I told you about this Capromulgus. This is outside the big four taxon um, central clade. We have this one Capromulgus that falls outside. And so for that one, this is kind of starting to look towards tomorrow with writing descriptions, they have this section, a new genus for Capromulgus enteratus. Um, large genetic divergence of enteratus from all other Capromulgids was unexpected. Ah, guess where it's from? Madagascar. Okay, but consistent with the long isolation of many Malagasy endemics. Species has always been placed in Capromulgus, although Clear commented that its position required further study. So, based on our results, we assign it to a new genus, Gactornus. That's a very beautiful name. <laughs> and the type species of Gactornus is Enaratus. That means that if there were other species to be described and placed in Gactornus, this is the one that would hold on to the name, the beautiful name of Gactornus. Yeah, yeah, this is, so here's another question for Mark. So basically, no defining morphological characters for the genus are yet known. The single species is unusually quiet for a Capromulgid. Its song is as yet unknown. So not much of a diagnosis. If all you've got is DNA sequences, at least tell us some diagnostic base pairs, and we can debate whether we want to do that. But yeah, that as a diagnosis would not make your instructors of this course very happy. Ah, look at this. 
Look at this. Read the etymology. Gactornis is formed by the four single letter abbreviations G, A, C, and T for the nucleotides of DNA and the Greek word ornus, bird. It refers to the fact that the distinctive, distinctiveness of the lineage only became apparent <coughs> upon examination of the nucleotide sequence of its DNA. So, when you see Mark, you go up to him and you say, how did you diagnose Gactornis? <laughs> Gactornis is masculine, and there'll be things about that in the, in the exercise later on. So the scientific name of the single species becomes Gactornis enteratus, and it's English name, I don't care. Okay? I actually hadn't noticed that, so that was a fun one. Um, any questions about Caprimulgid taxonomy? Other than what were you doing in that diagnosis and why did you submerge Phalaenopteris in Antrostomus? Remember, you have to make Mark squirm. You have to make him miserable when you see him. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Yes. I don't know, my question is a little bit uh, candid. I don't know, because I, when I see the, the appearance of uh, the atomics and the uh, I don't know if it is just a decision of uh, the author to, to give the name Gartonis, or there is a rule, because when you see the, the genus, it is Copper, copper mulgus, all the time now, the tonus appears. Uh -huh. So I, don't, I feel a bit, little bit uh, confused when I see. Okay, so the question is essentially why do we change the name from Capromulgus to Gactornus? Yes. So let's go back to the tree. And remember that we have this idea that all named taxa should be monophyletic. Okay? Now, if that's the case, if that's what we're going to say, and we have a Capromulgus, this, this one species, falling out here, then one option we have is to take this node and make everything within that, within that node Capromulgus. Okay? We could very easily do that. And that would require changing, so look, from this name up, Every generic name that is not Capromulgus would have to be changed. And so it actually brings in more instability. It changes more names to create a very large Capromulgus than to do some degree of name changes within. And I think, I think a lot of what they're saying is that these are major clades you know, it's, it's completely a matter of opinion. As Rafe said, we could argue about it back and forth and back and forth very easily. But I think they wanted to recognize some of the, these clades here and essentially give a, a somewhat finer, smaller classification of genera. But they didn't want to go all the way down to naming a lot of monotypic genera, single species genera. So, I think one part of the argument, I shouldn't speak for the authors, but I believe that one part of the uh, argument was that this clade, which is Cordylus, that clade is very well defined and, and morphologically quite distinct, behaviorally quite distinct. And so I think they were trying to create genera kind of on that level. And that was why they decided to do one, two, three, now watch four, five, six genera. And that meant that Enteratus, the one that becomes Gactornus, needed to be put in a new genus. Okay? So it's, it's because of this principle of monophyly that all higher taxa that we're going to use need to be a single, let's say this right here, a single lineage and all of its descendants. 
So if we want to keep using Caprimulgus for this species, then everything from here to the tips has to be Caprimulgus. Okay? That would be a huge genus. It might be the largest genus in birds. Any other questions? Dave. I was actually just going to make a comment. So we, we talked about appropriate names. And so I just wanted to point out that there's a great frog name in here that isn't available, right? And that's Nyctophrinus, which is the night toad, right? But that's a name for a bird here, right? Because that's what these frogs look like, or these birds look like, right? So that's a name that might be one that you would be interested in using for a new genus of toads, but you know, it's preoccupied here by a bird, so there's, you know, it's off the table, it's not available for you. That's a very good point. I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Any other questions, comments, ideas? protests.